All right. This is Boiler Exams with CS159 Fall 2022 Midterm Exam Number 2. I'm just going to get right into it. So, question one. Which of the following expressions will evaluate as true for all leap years and false otherwise? Up here we have a um, definition for a leap year. It needs to be divisible by 4, not divisible by 100, or divisible by 400. So if you remember, check if a number is divisible by another number. You just take the mod of it and see if it's equal to 0. If the mod is equal to 0, then it is divisible. Otherwise, it is not divisible. So if we look back at our statement, we want year mod 4 to be equal to 0, and year mod 100 to not be equal to 0, or year mod 400 to be equal to 0. So if we look at our answers, uh, year mod 4 is not equal to 0. That is wrong. It does need to equal 0. And then year mod 100 uh, does not equal 0. That's what we're looking for. That's that first statement. Or Year mod 400 is equal to 0. That's the second statement. So B is equivalent to what we have up here for a leap year. And then for completion, C is wrong because of these parentheses. It's um, asking, uh, no matter what, the year needs to be divisible by 4, but it either needs to not be divisible by 100 or not divisible by 400, which is not what this is saying. It does need to be divisible by 400. So, B is the right answer. Uh, moving on to number two. The logical complement of the expression defined above would be which of the following. So if you remember, the logical complement is a logical expression that is the exact opposite of whatever expression you have. So whenever the original expression is true, the complement is false. Whenever the original expression is false, the complement is true. So, in order to do that, we need to take each operator and reverse it. So if we look back at our statement for B, each of these equals would be changed into not equals. Each of the ands would be changed to ors. Each of the not equals would be changed to equals. If we had like a greater than sign, greater than sign, it would become a less than or equal to. If we had a, that's another less than or equal to, it would become greater than. So, in order to do this, what we'll do is take year, year mod four, it's not need to equal zero, or year mod. 100 does equal 0, and year mod 400 does not equal 0. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the original order of operations will stay in place. So here, these two statements have the and between them, so they're both connected. So we need some parentheses around here. And this is the statement that we're looking um, to find in number two. Um, if you look at these, year mod four is not equal to zero. It's the same thing as just year mod four because any number that is not zero will be evaluated as true. So if we just have year mod four, year mod four it's not equal to zero, we equal a number, so it will be true. And here, if your mod four is not equal to zero, it's just a number, so it will be true. So if we look at it, your mod four is not equal to zero. That is this statement, but it's being uh, taken the opposite of because of the not sign in front. So that is false. Your mod four, that's the same thing as this right here or your mod 100 is not equal to zero. That is what we have here, except this year mod 100 was not flipped. It was not taken the complement of, so that's false. Uh, your mod four, that's this, or your mod 100, 
that is what we have right here, and your mod 400 as this statement, so C is true. All right, moving on. Number three, which of the output generated by code segment A on the left, or sorry, what is the output generated? Uh, if we look at code segment A, we have uh, character C, which is a question mark, and an integer R, and then we have an else if construct. So, R is 51, so 51, 51 is not less than 25, so we move on. R is 51, 51 is not less than 50, so we move on. R is 51. 51 is less than 75, so we go into um, this code block and execute this um, statement. C becomes L. And then we exit the else if statements and we print whatever C is. So we get C is L. Uh, number four, what is the output generated by code submit B on the right? We have a similar statement, but instead it is a switch statement. So we're switching based on r over 25. 80 divided by 25 equals, what would that be? 3.2. Uh, since these are both integers, this gets truncated to just 3. So our switch um, statement that we're going to use is 3. So if we go down to case 3, case 3 uh, set C equal to R, so we'll just put an R there, um, and then there's no break, so we just move on to the next statement, which sets C equal to question mark, and then we exit the switch statement, and then we print that. So if we look at here, um, none of these are question marks which means the answer is D. Uh, so remember, unless there's a break, the switch statement will just keep on plowing on. After case three, it will move on to the question mark. Uh, if we were switching based off of zero, it would set C equal to E, and then move on, set C equal to F, then hit the break and exit the switch statement. So if you don't have a break, be aware, it'll just move on to the next statement. Question five, which of the following ranges do the two code segments above generate the same output? So let's see, from zero to 25, let me make a table, let's do that. Yep, from zero to 25, we have A over here, B over there. So between zero and 25, let's put R there. Code segment A will equal E. If it was larger to 25, this would be false. If it was smaller, um, it would still be less than 25. For code segment B, if we put something between 0 and 25, actually, wait, no, this is still right, yeah. If we had something between 0 and 25, because of um, the truncation, uh, since it's an integer, the switch would always be 0. And so we'd go to case 0, which would set C equal to E, which is no break, so then set C equal to F, and then it'd break. So when R is between 0 and 25, B equals F. Between 25 and 50, R believe would just be equal to f, because if it was less than 25, it would go into this if statement. If it was greater than 50, uh, this would be false, and move on to the next one. So it's just, just f. Here, uh, a number between 25 and 50 divided by 25, uh, because a truncation is just going to equal 1. Uh, this doesn't include 50, by the way. So if we go to case 1, sets equal to f, then exits the switch statement. So this is also f. And then you get the idea. 
50 and 75. Cosegment A would make it L. The switch statement would make it L2. And then 75 and 50, or sorry, 100. We would have the statement sets it equal to R. And B sets it equal to question mark. So the answer is R is between 25 and 75. So that would be A. R is greater than 25 and less than 75, not including the 75, which is what we just outlined right here. All right, next question, question six. Which of the following is the first line output generated by the code segment above? Here we have some code. The first uh, print statement is asking for the values of x and y, and the last one's for z. Looks like z is question seven. Uh, let's just go through the code. So starting off x, y, and z is equal to zero. We have plus plus x. This is a prefix, prefix increment, so We'll set x equal to 1, and we pass a value of 1 here, because it, since it's a prefix, we use the incremented value in here instead of the pre-incremented value. Then we have one of these conditional expressions. We, um, it returns this, if this is true, and it returns this, if this is false. Since we have a positive number here, negative numbers also work. Since it's a non-zero number, we will use the true statement. So z will get incremented. We use the post, sorry, the pre-increment value. And then this entire statement's equal to zero, which is false. Then we have and y plus plus. Since this is false, we will have a, um, a short circuit. Mm-hmm. So we'll move on. This is um false. Move on to the next elf set. We have y plus plus, increment y, use the pre incremented value, or uh, minus minus c, decrement z, use the post decremented value. So Yeah, this is what we have. We have another short circuit, which means we move on to the next statement, x plus y plus c. This gives us 1 plus 1 plus 0, which is 2. 2 is true, but we have a not operator in front of that, so this will all be false, So, which means this gets skipped too. So these are our final values. X is 1, Y is 1, and Z is 0. So 6, X is 1, Y is 1. 7, um, Z will not be 65, 66, or 67. It's 0. None of the above. Uh, 65, 66, and 67 correspond to capital A, capital B, and capital C. But since all these if statements were false, we never set Z equal to any of them. So, the answer is none of the above. Oh, there's one more question. Which operator short circuits in the code segment above? So we can see uh, in line 10, we have a short circuit, and in line 14, we have a short circuit. Um, so, logical and on line 10, that is true, but this doesn't include line 14, so that one's false. Logical and on line 14, that is also true, but it doesn't include line 10. So that is false. Logical or in line 14, that is just false. So the answer is D again, because we had short circuits in 10 and 14. All right, cool, moving on. Which of the following statements regarding operators is true? Native logic refers to only those expressions that begin with a not operator. This is false. I like to use an F for false. You can have negative logic that 
doesn't necessarily include a not operator. If uh, we go back to the leapier example, an example of negative logic would be right here, not divisible by 100. We did that by taking year mod 100 and then using a not equal sign. So this is an example of negative logic that does not use a not operator. So that's false. B. Logical operators can be surrounded by an extra set of parentheses to disable short circuiting behavior. This is false. You cannot disable short circuiting behavior. An extra set of parentheses just does nothing. Uh, C we will ignore them. So on to C. The logical, relational, and comparative operators always evaluate to either 0 or 1. This is true. 0 and 1 correspond to true and false, and those three operators will all either output true or false. So, 9C. 10. Which of the following statements regarding selection is false? Reordering the conditions in an if-else, if-else construct does not change the program logic. This is false. So that's our answer. Reordering the conditions does change logic. If you imagine we had if true, uh, sorry, actually, let's put that over here. Um, A equals zero, and then else if true. A equals 1. If we move the second else if in front of this one, we would have A equals 1 instead of A equals 0. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you had an else if construct that had multiple true statements, changing the order of the else ifs does change um, what the program logic is. So, A is false means it's our answer. For completion, we'll go through the other ones. B, multi-way selection can be simulated by nesting if-else or nesting conditional expressions. This is true. If you had four different options you want to select between, you could use four different else-ifs, and it would give you the same exact logic as a, another multi-way selection method, like using a switch construct. So B is true. Reordering only the cases in a switch construct, provided that each ends with a break statement, does not change the program logic. Now, this one is true. Um, if you had a switch statement with multiple cases, the switch construct searches for the case that matches whatever um, expression you give it. And so it doesn't matter where it um, is in the switch construct. Um, when the switch construct will find it, it executes it. And so no matter where it is, program logic does not change. So 10 is A. Next question. 11. Which of the following statements regarding the switch construct is true? The control expression that follows the keyword switch cannot be a character expression. So the control expression is whatever you put in the parentheses right there. This needs to um needs to be an integer. You can't use a float in the switch um, control expression. But if you remember, a character is the same thing as an integer. You can use the ASCII table to translate between characters and integers. So, you are able to use a character expression. Oh, sorry, I see why I'm dead. You are able to use a character expression, which means A is false, because it's saying you cannot use a character expression. You could switch based off the character A, and it would work normally. It would just be, you know, ASCII code 66 or whatever. 
B, the maximum number of actions that can be associated with a case label is one. This is also false. If we had a case zero, you could put, you know, five lines of code here, perform five different actions all in one case, and the switch um, construct would work normally. C, each case label is the keyword case followed by a constant expression. This is true, so that is our answer. The case label is this right here. In this case, it would be the zero. This needs to be a constant. Um, we can't use variables, and so C is true. Which of the following sets of operators is composed only of comparative operators? So, for this one, A has relational operators. Oops. B is the comparative operators. And C is logical operators. So the answer is B. Equals and not equals to are comparative operators. So that's the answer. All right. Question 13. Which of the following is the output generated by the code segment above? If we look at our code. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. We have x equals this number, y equals 0. While x mod 2 is not true. Is that what that's saying? x mod 2. If x is even, x mod 2 will equal 0. And then the not operator will make it true. So this is just asking, is x um, divisible by 2? Is it even? Then we will run this while loop. So go ahead and make a table. Let's have y and x. x is this. So, for our first iteration, x is even, so we'll go into the code. We add to y um, x mod 10. x mod 10 will give us the last digit of x, so we're going to add 2 to y, and then mod it by 3. Uh, 2 mod 3 is 2 again, and then we divide x by 10. Uh, 10 is an integer, x is an integer. So we will do integer math. If we divide by 10, we get 89,068.2. And then we truncate off the last digit, so we get 89,068. And then we do our next iteration of the loop. x is still divisible by 2. So we take the last digit of x, add it to y. This will give us 10. 10 mod 3 will equal 1. Then we remove the last digit of x x is still even, so we do another loop iteration. 6 plus 1 is 7. 7 mod 3 is still 1. And then x equals 890. 890 is even, so we do another loop iteration. We add last digit of x to y, so it gives us 1 again. 1 mod 3 is still 1, so we do another these. And so, now, if we check x, x is no longer even, which means our loop control expression is false. So we exit it, and then we go to our print. And we see y is equal to 1. So, 13 is c. 14. How many total times is the loop control expression evaluated in the code segment above? Uh, if we count, we evaluate it once when we started, so it's going to be once, then we did it again, and again, and again, and a fifth time. So the answer is five times. If x were instead initialized to 240138, the one with the output generated by the code segment above, let's see, we would, first of all, is x 
um, even uh, it is. So we take y, add 8 to it. 8 mod 3 is 2. Take off the last digit of x. And then we have 24,013, which is odd. So that's the end of the loop. So y equals 2. All right. Cool. All right, question number 16. Which of the following is the output generated by the code segment above? Here we have some code. We want to know what happens to x. So x is 0 to start with. 0 is greater than or equal to 0. 0 is less than 10, so we will... Um, this is true. This is true. They're both true, so we enter this code statement. x has 10 added to it. Then we go to the next step statement. X is greater than or equal to 10. That is true. 10 is less than 20. That is true. So we add 1 to X. Enter the last if statement. 11 is less than 30. So we execute this code. Multiply X by 110. And then print whatever X is. X is 110. So... C is our answer. 17. Which of the following changes to the logical expressions in the code segment above would make the output 100? So, if we look at our three if statements, if we want x to be 100, then we need to add 10 to x and then multiply it by 10. So, we need this middle statement to go from true to false. So, just looking at our answers, C and D are both Sorry, C and B are both wrong, because we need to modify line 11, not line 15. If we look at line 11, um, when we have x equals to 10, we have is 10 greater than 10, which is false, 10 less than 20, which is true, and then an and statement. Since 10 is not less, sorry, was it saying less than? 10 is not greater than 10. This is false, which means we will not execute the code in here. So if we were to substitute this expression into this if statement, we would not um, increment x by 1. So we just have x plus 10, then x times 10, which would make x 100. So A is our answer. Eighteen. Which of the following is the output generated by the first print statement in the code segment above? So, for our code, we have this array with eight values in it, and then a for loop. It's a good idea to make tables with for loops. Let's do... Yeah, okay. This will be all we have in our table. So, i is 1. Check our loop control expression. 1 is less than 8, so we can execute an, um, uh, a loop of our code. Index equals x of i plus x of i minus 1. So, if we look here, x of 1 would be 7, and then x of 1 minus 1 is x is 0, which would be our 2. So 2 plus 7 is 9, and x equals 9. So now we take index mod 8, and we add 2 to it. So 9 mod 8 is 1, so we're going to go to index 1 and add 2 to it. It's going to give us 9. We add 1 to i, and we do this again. So, x of 2 is 4, x of 1 is 9, 9 plus 4 is 13, 13 mod a is 5, so we go to our fifth value, add 2 to it. Uh, remember for arrays, uh, these are zero index, so if I just write the indexes above them, it starts at zero and ends at 
7. All right, add 1 to i. 3 is less than 8. So index becomes 1 plus 4, 5. So we add 2 to index 5. 4 is less than 8. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 mod a is still 3. So we add 2 to value 3. 5 is still less than 8. 7 plus 2 is 9. 9 mod 8 is 1. So we're going to add 2 to value 1. 6 is less than 8. 6 plus 7 is 13. 13 mod 8 is 5. So we're going to add 2 to value 5. 7 is less than 8. Um, 5 plus 6 is 11. 11 mod 8 is 3. So we're going to add 2 to value 3. And then i is 8. 8 It's not less than 8. So we exit our loop. And then we print out the values of x of 1 and x of 5. So x of 1 equals the value of x of 1, which is 11. That is a. And then number 19, the second print statement, x of 5. x of 5 is 9. So the answer is c. Great. Which of the following statements regarding recursive solutions is false? The base case is when the function stopped calling itself. That is true. The base case is the last function call. It is when instead of calling the function calls itself again, it just um, uses a value that it has coded into it. So A is true. Recursion functions must have a return value. This is false. Uh, recursive solutions or recursive functions don't have to return anything. They can just modify variables that you send it, or they can um, print stuff or scan stuff from the user. Recursive functions don't necessarily need to return values. If a recursion results in an excess, sorry, if recursion results in an excessive number of function calls, memory will be exhausted and the program will fail. This is true. If um, you had a recursive solution that called itself a hundred times, you probably wouldn't run out of memory, but if it called itself a million times or a billion times, that can use up a lot of memory in the computer. If it uses up enough memory, it can result in the computer crashing because it doesn't have enough memory to um, deal with all the function calls. So C is true. And B was the only false one, so that's the answer. 21. Which of the following is not a possible outcome of an array index range violation in the executable statement section of a function? So an array index range violation is when you have an array, let's call it 1, 2, 3, And you try to call, let's say, x of 4. So we're trying to ask for a data value that is over here, well outside of our array. So what could happen? There could be a random garbage value here. The What's this asking? What is not a possible outcome? Okay, I see what it's saying. So yeah, there could be a garbage value here. And so x of 4 will return, you know, maybe 2 million. And it'll be a completely useless value will break your program. Here could be a data that is reserved by the operating system. Trying to access it could cause the program to crash because the operating system won't let the program access this data. And those are pretty much the two possible outcomes. 
this could also just be an undefined address. It's an address that doesn't exist, which could also cause um, a program to crash. So the program is able to crash. The program may produce expected output. I guess that's also true. If you expected x of 4 to equal 3, and there just happened to be a value of 3 here, the program would produce the expected output. So A is true, B is true. The program will increase the size of the array automatically. This is false. If you try to access something outside of the array, um, C will not increase the size of the array automatically. That is not a thing it will do. Um, so C is the answer. Which of the following statements regarding arrays in the C programming language is true? The name of an array is a reference to the address of where it begins inside the memory of the computer. This is true. The name of the array it is the address of where the first value in the array is in the memory. B, a negative index value represents an offset from the last element of the array. This is false. Some programming languages allow you to do this, like Python. C does not. This will not work in um, C. Declaration and definition of an array will include a default initialization of all elements. This is false. When you declare and define an array, um, there will not, by default, be a value in each um, array slot of the array. In each array index, unless you manually define a value there, it will um, be undefined. So, A is our answer. Which of the following statements regarding arrays in the C programming language is false? Individual elements of an array can be passed by address through the use of the address operator. This is true. Just like any other variable, you can use the address operator to get the address of an element in the array, and then you can pass that to a function. If more than one element of an array is passed to a function as separate parameters in a single function call, then those elements are passed by address. This is false. So this is our answer. If you're just passing individual elements in an array, it doesn't matter how many you pass, they will all be passed by value. Arrays only get passed by address if you specifically put an address operator in front of the value, or if you're passing the entire address as one uh, large variable. If we had like here, f of x, that's not what I wanted, fx, x, we're passing the entire array, so this array would be passed by address. Otherwise, it will be passed by value. For completion, let's do C. In order to prevent a function from making changes to an entire array that is passed as in as a parameter, the calling function must manually copy, make a copy of the array to provide to the called function. This. Um. This is true. I see what it's saying now. So, like I said, when you pass an um, entire array to a function, it is passed by address. If you don't want to pass by address, you want to pass it by value, you need to manually make a copy of the array and then pass the copy of the array to the called function. Otherwise, it will be being passed by address. So the answer is B. All right, now we have question 24. What is the output generated by line number 18 in the program above? All right, here's line 18. Um, we have a user defined function and our main function. Inside the main function, we have uh, two arrays and a for loop. Uh, we have a for loop, so I'm going to go ahead and make a table. Oop, what was that? So we're going to have i. Result 
und Test auch nichts. So I starts as one. Oops. So when I is one, we're going to add to result whatever test elements is for I plus one, X of I and Y of I. And right here's test elements. Uh, this is a, a big mess, huh? I'm gonna make another table. A, B, and C for test elements. So first we pass it I plus one, and then we pass it um, X of one, which is five. Then we pass it Y of one, which is two. Remember arrays are zero indexed. This is index zero, this is index one. So now we take these values, plug them into here. Now, if you look at this, you need to be careful about precedence. Modulus has the highest precedence out of these operators, but this equals to operator has a higher precedence than this conditional expression question mark operator. If we just go down here real quick. First we do modulus then we do relational operators, then we do this ternary conditional operator. So going back to our question, here B mod A is one, we do the other modulus, C mod A is zero, and now we do the equality operator, what do they call it, the equals to operator. One is not equal to zero, so this is all equal to false, which means we go to here, instead of executing the true one, we execute the false one, so we just return zero. So we add zero to result. i is now two, two is less than six, so a becomes three, b becomes two, c becomes eight, and we do this again. b mod a is 2. C mod A is 2 again. So 2 is equal to 2. So we're going to do this mess. We're going to prefix increment C. C is now 9. We use the incremented value. Which is 9. Mod A is 3. So that's all equal to 0. So we're going to do return 1. Yep. So test elements equals 1, result equals 1. When i is 3, 3 is less than 6. a becomes 4, b is 3, c is 5. 3 mod 4 is 3. 5 mod 4. 5 mod 4 is 1. Sorry, 3 mod 4. 3 mod three mod 4 is 3. So we get another 0. Right? Alright. 4. A is 5. X is... Nine. Y is four. So, these values, B mod A is 4, C mod A, 
C mod A is 4. These equal to each other, so this is uh, equal to operator is true. So we're going to go to this middle statement. Plus plus C is 5. So 5 mod A is 5. 5 mod 5 is 0 again. So we're going to turn 1. Result is 2. I is now 5. So A is 6. And then X of I is X of 5. If you notice, we only have that's index 4. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But we're defining these arrays to have a size of 6. But we only define 5 values. So what C will do actually is index 5, they'll put zeros. So x of 5 is 0, y of 5 is 0. So we're going back to here. 0 mod 6 is 0. 0 mod 6 is 0. These are both true, so we're going to go to this inside statement. C++ plus plus is 1. 1 mod 6 is 1. Since 1 is not a 0, um, it's not 0. We're going to execute this middle one. We're going to return 2. So test element equals 2. Result equals 4. I now equals 6. 6 is not less than 6. So we leave this for loop. So on line 18, the program will print. The result is 4. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. 25, line 19, um, is asking what is x at size minus 1? Gotta stop doing that. So 6 minus 1 is x of 5, and we can see um, c adds the 0 in, and so x of 5 is 0. All right, 26. Which of the following statements would correctly initialize the random number generator using the integer variable seed? So, to initialize the random number generator, we use the sran function, and we give it whatever our seed value is. And so that way, every time we call rand, after initializing it with srand, rand will return the same sequence of random integers every single time. So, this is what I wrote, semicolon, B is the answer. A and C are both wrong because, well, A is wrong because srand doesn't return anything. You can't assign it to a variable. And C is wrong because it doesn't even include srand. B is the answer. Which of the following expressions would generate a random number between the positive integers low and high inclusive? So this is inclusive, so that's including the low bound and the high bound. First, um, rand creates a random integer between like, you know, negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion. So we need to mod it by the difference between our high and low. we just say low is 5, high is 10, there are 6 integers between 5 and 10 inclusive, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we need 6 different integers from rand. High minus low is 5, 5 or 10 minus 5 is 5, but we need 6 different integers because there's 6 integers between 5 and 10. So we need to add 1. This will give us rand mod 6. Rand mod 6 will give us integer values between 0 and 5. We will get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 from just this here. So if we add all that with low, instead of being 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we'll get 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So this right here is the expression for generating positive integers low and high um, inclusive between those bounds. So our answer is C.
All right, another code. Um, which of the following is the output generated by the first print statement in the program above? The first print statement is, this one's asking what x is zero is. It wants to know what all three print statements um, are. So we need to calculate what happens to the array. We have an array with seven values and a for loop. So we have a for loop. Let's make a table. Um, I'm not sure what we need to make a table of. Let's have i x of i minus one. We'll find those two and then we'll make another table. So i is 1, 1 is less than or equal to 7. So we're going to pass um, our array x and x of i minus 1. So that's going to be x is 0, which is 2. Uh, another thing to be aware of x is the entire array, so this is being passed by address, while x of i minus 1 is just a value. It's an individual element of x. This is being passed by value. If we go to change data, we have an integer j and another for loop. For j is equal to x, j is less than 7, plus plus j. So we're going to need another um, table. Let's look at what this is saying. We're going to set j equal to x. So right now x is 2, so j equals 2. If j is greater than y of j, so if 2 is greater than y of 2, y is our array, x, so y of 2 would be 6. If j is greater than 6, that's false. We go to here. J is, so if j is greater than 6, we do this. If j is less than 6, we add 1 to whatever y of j was. Mm-hmm. So let's walk it through. Let's make another table. j. It's really the only thing we need to keep track of. j. We'll keep track of the array up here. So j starts off as 2. I know what yj actually. Alright, so y of j, yeah, y of 2 is 6. 6, 2 is not greater than 6. So we're going to add 1 to y of j. It's now 7. I'm actually going to move this up here. Alright. Add 1 to j. j is not less than 7. Or j is less than 7, sorry. So y of j is equal to 8. 3 is not greater than 8, so we're going to do this. You're now 9. j is now 4. 4 is less than 7 y of 4 is 1. 4 is greater than 1, so we're going to go into here. x will be set to j. Um, that doesn't actually do anything, because so we don't use x anywhere. We only use it for the initialization of the loop, so we can just ignore that. Uh, y of j is going to be subtracted by 1, so now you are 0. Add 1 to j, j is less than 7 y of j is 3, 5 is greater than 3, so we're going to subtract 1, and then now we have 6, 6 is less than 7, so we're going to do this one more time, and so 6 is greater than 5, subtract 1, and then that's the end.
j7, jet7 is not less than 7, so we exit the loop, turn control back to this loop, and we advance it 1. Or, I'm sorry, we actually advance it by 2. i gets added 2 to each time. Let's just erase this. All right. So x of 2 is 7. So j becomes 7. 7 is already not less than 7. So we don't even execute anything in the code. We immediately return control back to this loop. i is 5. X of 4 is 0. So over here, J is 0. Y is 0 is 2. 0 is not greater than 2. So we're going to add 1. J is 1. Y, J is 5. 1 is not greater than 5. Now 6. J is 2, YJ is 7, 2 is not greater than 7, J is 3, Y is 9, J is not greater than 9, J is 4, Y is 0, 4 is greater than 0, now we have minus 1. J is 5. Yj is 2, 5 is greater than 2, j is 6, yj is 4, 6 is greater than 4, no, sorry, now j is 7, 7 is not less than 7, so we exit our loop, turn control back to here. Add 1 to i, i is now 7, uh, 7 minus 1 is 6, y6 is 3. Oh, and by the way, yeah, loop control expression is still good. So now we go back to here. Do this one more time. So j is 3. Go over here. Get 10. 3 is not less than 10, so you become 11. 4 is minus 1. 4 is greater than minus 1, so we're going to get minus 2. 5. 1. 5 is greater than 1. We're going to get 0. 6 3. 6 is greater than 3. And then 7. 7 is not less than 7, so we return control back to here. Add 2 to i. Get 9. 9 is not less than or equal to 7, so now we exit this loop. And so now we just do our print statements x of 0 equals 3, x of 4 is minus 2, x of 6 is 2. So if we go down to here, x of 0, that's 3, let's see, 29, um, x of 4, x of 4 is minus 2, that is b, 30, x of 6 is 5 as 2, what happened? Okay, so 30, x is 6, x is 6 is 2, so that means the answer is none of the above, D. Alright, another code segment, 31, which of the following is not a line of output generated by the for loop in the main function of the program above? 
Let's look at that for loop. We have 4 and a 5, 8, 6, 1, 7. So long as n is greater than 9, do this. And inside here, we just print whatever n is. Calc files doesn't affect n. So for just answering question 31, we can actually just ignore calc files. If we make our loop, we have n total. For now, I'm just going to ignore total. n starts as 5, 8, 6, 1, 7. Um, when we run this loop once, we will get 5, 8, 6, 1. 5, 8, 6, 1 is still greater than 9, so we'll run this again. And we'll get divided by 10. 5, 8, 6 is still greater than 9. Run this again. 58 is still greater than 9, so we run this again. And then 5 is not greater than 9. So in this loop, we will print n equals 58617, n equals 5861, n equals 586, and n equals 58. So over here, we will not print n equals 0. This loop will end before then. Alright, so next question, question 32. Which of the following is not a line of output generated from the function calc files of the program above? So for this, we need to actually figure out what total is. In order to do that, we need to figure out uh, what calc files is doing. So for the first pass of the loop, we're going to pass it n equals 58617. So calc files, we have int i, int j, and total equals 0. j is equal to x mod 5, and then we have this loop. So I'm going to go ahead and make another table. So 58617 mod 5, that will equal Let's do that. Here's our x that we passed it. Uh, 7 mod 5 is 2. 58610 is all divisible by 5, so we can just remove that. All we have to do is look at the 7 and 7 mod 5. So 58617 mod 5 equals 2. i is 1, so long as i is less than or equal to j, i plus equals 2. So the total is going to have j added to it, total equals 2. Now we're going to print the total, I think, yeah, yeah. Question 32 wants to know what is printed by calc valves, so I'm just going to keep track of um, the values that we have printed right here. First we're going to print 2. And now we go back to here. i is 3. 3 is not less than or equal to, um, to j, which is 2. So that's the end of this loop, and we just return 2. So we're going to add 2 to our total up here. Now, We're going to pass 5861. 5861 mod 5 is 1. So i equals 1. Add 1 to total. i becomes 3. 3 is not less than or equal to 1, so we return 1. And we've also printed 1. Now we're going to pass 586. 586 mod 5 is still 1. So we're actually just going to get the same exact code ran. Nothing new. Now we're going to have 58. 58 mod 3, or sorry, mod 5 is 3. So 
So I'm going to add one. I'm going to run this once. Add three to total. I is now three. Three is less than or equal to um, three. So we're going to run this again. Total becomes six. And then we add two to I again. I is five. Five is not less than or equal to um, three. So we return back to here and we add six. And then we've also printed three and six. And then that's the end of the loop because now we have n equals five and five is not greater than nine. So question 32, what have we not printed? We have gotten two, one, three, and six. We have not gotten a zero. So 32 is A. What is the final uh, total? The final line of output generated by the main function above. That's just asking what the final total is, which we calculated to be 10. 33 is B. Which of the following statements regarding the program above is true? The logic makes use of nested repetition. That's true, actually. Here we have loop number one, and then we are continuously calling this function, which has another loop. So we have a loop inside a loop. B, the loop in the main function, that's the answer by the way. The loop in the main function is an event control process because the update expression changes the loop control variable by a value of plus one or minus one. This is false. There is no event that this loop is looking for. It is a counter control process because this is just counting the number of digits in n. So b is false. c. The loop in the main function is an event control process. Well, we've already, we already know that's false because the update expression involves division. It's not true. For the most part, if you ever have a for loop, it will almost I'd say like 90-95% of the time it will be counter controlled. Event controlled is really for while loops and do while loops, stuff like input validation. There needs to be something that the program's looking for, not just a counter like we have here. So 34A is the answer. And then 35. Which of the following statements regarding the upcoming schedule for class in CS159 is true? That's not a, a real question. This is a question just for the class that took this exam. So that's the end of the exam. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. This is Boiler Exams. See ya.